Thank you. Hello? 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 Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the work that we've been doing for the last uh, couple of years with you. Um, I'm going to be focusing on a specific uh, part of the work, and that is uh, specifically looking at the money system. Um, and um, just, you know, I think it's why, why it's why it's fitting is because you know the money system is the circulatory system of our of our global financial system and our local systems. So when things go wrong and they get blocked, you need to take intervention. So I thought it was fitting to to dedicate the the, um, the talk today um, to the late doctor. So um, the. The organization that, uh, that I represent is called FLOW, which stands for Fostering Local Wellbeing. Um, and in, in, in doing that, Fostering Planetary Wellbeing. So just to quickly introduce us, and I will get into what we actually do, I'd like to share a quote that, that really inspired our work. Um, it was from a book called Money and Sustainability, The Missing Link, by a gentleman called Bernard Leetire. Um, it was written for the Club of Rome. And in the foreword to the book, um, the sort of the doyan of, of systems thinking, in 1972, he spoke about how we're facing a planetary limits. You know, he, he raised the warning, you know, over 40 years ago, Dennis Meadows. And in the foreword to the book, he says, we will never create sustainability while immersed in the present financial system. There is no tax, no interest rate or disclosure requirement that can overcome the many ways the current money system blocks sustainability. I used to not think this. Indeed, I did not think about the money system at all. I took it for granted as a neutral and inevitable aspect of human society. I now understand that the prevailing financial system is incompatible with sustainability. So those are very powerful words because it's, the money system is something that we just get born into. We just accept it, we grow up, we get given our bank cards, we take out bonds, we acquire our houses, and we're just in the system and we never really have an opportunity to step back and think, this is a system that has essentially been designed by humans. And it was designed 300 years ago at the, at, at the onset of the, of the Industrial Revolution. It's the same system that we're using today and I think what we're seeing, not only with the work that we're doing, but, but, but with things like Bitcoin and, and alternative currencies, that humans have woken up to maybe we can redesign our systems to be more equitable and more sustainable. So this is, this is the essence of what the talk is going to be about. So just to quickly um, introduce the team. So this is a picture. These are some of the people that are involved. Dominic van den Hart is... Uh, He's actually here. He's, he's um, our mojo extraordinaire. But just to share with you, we, we are a transdisciplinary team. So we believe that in order to, to deal with these issues, we need to have multiple disciplines working in concert. So Anna Khan, um, my, the, the other co-founder and, and my partner, is an architect urbanist. Um, I've been introduced. Penny's an environmental scientist. She's got local and provincial government. Gina and Martin are from the University of Cape Town, who are, um, who are partners with us. Gina Zuvogel was recently um, elected the, uh, uh, selected as the Young Scientist, given this Young Scientist Award by the national government. Martin Fisser is a behavioral economist um, in the Department of Economics, a professor. Joanne Lees, architect. We're working with Will Raddick, who's based in Kenya. He started his life as a high energy physics, moved to econophysics, and he's been doing extraordinary pioneering work in Kenya with complementary and community currencies. Daniel Goodman, graphic designer, communication strategist. Dominic van den Hart, mobile journalist, visual storyteller. And our two local coordinators in, in, in the two regions we're working with who are both farmers and uh, development practitioners and in my mind, entrepreneurs. So that gives you a, a quick taste of the team that's involved. I'm representing the team. Um, but this is the team that's tackling the, the, the challenge that uh, I'm going to share with you. So just quickly to share with you our funding partners. Um, the project is funded uh, through National Treasury. So it's quite ironic. I, I, um, I made the comment that, uh, um, you know, that, that 
National Treasury is, is actually looking for innovative ways to address social ills in this country. Um, and it's in partnership with the Flanders government um, from Belgium. And uh, mentioned UCT, Meshfield is the organization that uh, Anna and I um, have set up and, and have been co-funding the project. And the Berg River Municipality, which is one of the municipalities that we're working with, is also co-funding the project. So we're working in two areas. The one is in the Bergevier area. Um, you may know it. It's an area that you probably drive past on your way to somewhere else. So Picketburg is on the N7. So if you're driving up to Namibia or to the Northern Cape, um, you will go through Picketburg, which is one of the, one of the nine towns in, in the Bergevier area. We're also working in Kokstad which is in southern KwaZulu-Natal, and it's on the border of, so it's kind of like a, a, a border town between the Eastern Cape, KwaZulu-Natal, and, and Lesotho. So these are the two areas that we're working in, two very fundamentally different areas. So really just to, um, to share a little bit more about what we term the poly crisis, the perfect storm that uh, is converging on, on, on the globe, um, which is a combination of the climate change, resource depletion, the eco ecosystem collapse, global financial instability, which is actually happening more frequently, so the, 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 the events are more severe and, and they're more frequent. And of course something that is not unfamiliar to us in South Africa is mounting poverty and inequality, but it's happening in the develop, uh, developed countries as well now. So just a few snapshots, I'm not going to spend time um, in going into this in detail. This is at the, at the broadest global planetary levels, but the, what, what, what the way that we contribute to this is that we um, through, through our linear, industrialized, globalized um, economies, which we extract uh, raw materials from the ground, we pump them through factories, these massive factories, which obviously at the moment are mostly based in, in, in Asia. We then have these global distribution channels, and um, it's a well-known fact that food that is and any other uh, goods that are transported around the world almost uh, two-thirds, if not three-quarters, of the cost is transport costs. So it's getting made cheaper in China, but there's a cost to transporting it. We consume it, we buy the goods at the supermarkets, and ultimately it ends up on the rubbish dump. So that's our linear economy. So we, and we believe that this can continue forever. And as Dennis Meadows pointed out, we have limits to growth. We cannot grow forever. Some headlines just sharing global financial instability. So this one is from 1929. This one was from last Monday. Okay, you, you, you may be aware that the, the global stock markets have been kicked off by, by China and it's offset all sorts of instability around the world because we all connected. And these are some of the other, um, the other pictures um, from, from magazines. Now just to share with you um, uh, an IMF report that, that, ha that gets done every year looking at um, three crises in particular. It's difficult to read these, so I'll read them for you. The first is a banking crisis. So that's, that's if bank or banks get into trouble. And that's what central banks are for, is to protect the economy if there's a banking crisis. The next one is a currency crisis. We've experienced that in, in 2001 or 2002 in South Africa, where our currency literally just fell out of bed. Um, and people were accused of taking bets against it, but these are currencies, that, this is when a, a, a country's currency becomes, devalues tremendously against other currencies and it obviously kicks off all sorts of internal systemic problems. And then finally, um, sovereign debt crises. Um, debt crises, uh, it's not just sovereign, but what we're facing today, in 2008 the governments were able to bail out the banks. The debt that has been accumulated since 2008 means that now there are countries that are probably going to be going bankrupt. And my opinion is that if, our, if South Africa decides to invest 1.1 trillion rand in building a nuclear plant, that debt will ultimately be the um, undoing of South Africa. Um, but certainly Greece has been in the headlines and uh, there's, there's, there's a number of countries that are on the watch list, Brazil, Mexico, Venezuela. So just to share with you, since so this is, these statistics have started uh, being collected between 1970 and 2011, there have been 146 banking crises, 218 currency crises, and 66 sovereign debt crises. So uh, Argentina is a great example where that, that's happened. So that's 430 systemic crises in total over the last 41 years. So that means 
every year there are 10 countries that are in trouble. And what's, what's interesting to note, and I, 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 this was, I picked this up when I was reading the report yesterday, is that the month where banking crises typically start happened to be September for some strange reason. So that's, uh, you know, it's, I, I do believe that we're, he we're heading into troubled times. Compounding this um, is, is uh, the inequality and poverty that, that, that our global financial system and our way of making things has unleashed. Um, uh, Wilkinson and, and Pickett, who incidentally are epidemiologists, initially they were epidemi epidemiologists, and then started looking at what the causation, so look, picking up strong correlations between inequality and social ills around the, uh, in, in the UK initially and then around the world. And they've basically, you know, they've, pro they've proven that it's better, not just, you know, because we say it is, but because health improves, murders go down, um, is, you know, social, social welfare goes up if we live in a more equal society. And Thomas Piketty, of course, the French economist who, um, who started talking about wealth inequality as, a, as contrasted to income inequality. And, uh, and, and talking about how wealth inequality um, comes from generations, you know, um, leaving and, uh, their, their wealth. And then the Gini coefficient, the Gini coefficient, for those of you that aren't um, aware, is, is a measure of inequality. It's a number between zero and one. Um, we have the dubious honor of being uh, the highest in the world. So, this, so the warmer colors are obviously where the, where the inequality is the worst. So Latin America and, and certainly this, this part of Africa. So we're sitting somewhere at 0 0.63, 0 0.64. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into that. And I'm going to come back to the Gini coefficient shortly. So what are the symptoms that our current money system causes? So it causes the boom and bust cycles, the financial crises. It produces short-term thinking. A lot, you know, the companies are focused on the next quarter, on the year. So that's, it's, it's, you're not really worried about what's going to happen in 50 years' time. It's like, you know, what, am I going to be in, um, um, in business long enough to make a profit? This is a very important point uh, r relating to the limits to growth argument is that the money system requires unending growth. One of the things that central bankers are panicking about in the world is the fact that the interest rates are at zero, most of the countries around the world, or close to zero, and, um, and at the same time, the, 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 the countries are falling into, into um, deflation. So without growth, our money system doesn't actually work. Um, it concentrates wealth. We saw that with inequality. So the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And ultimately, it destroys social capital, I believe, because it it's essentially sets up a game where you, know, you need to compete against the next person to get you know, the, that, 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 um, that's, that, that rand. So what I'd like to show um, is uh, what I'd like to share with you now is a simulation that was put together by our colleague Will Ruddick, um, really demonstrating, in particular, one of the design flaws of our of, of our money system, and and the one that 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 I'm going to be focusing on now is is interest, and just to show you what happens to trade and inequality in a small village community where there's a hundred traders. So this is a, a computer agent based. Uh, model simulation, and uh, it's, I'm just going to share with you what actually happens. Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, I'll be talking over it. Okay, so, so what you have here, oops. okay, so what you have here in the top graph are, it's, it's the amount of money that, uh, um, let me just stop it while I talk. So it's amount of money, so these are 100 traders. So imagine there was a small community that's um, separated from the world, and there's 100 traders in this community, and these are the balances of their, of their cash. So... You can see that some, some people have got higher balances and some people have lower balances. Some people have goods and services that are highly in demand, others don't. And that's fine, that's normal. I mean, that's, you know, you're not gonna get a society where everybody's gonna be completely the same. 
So competition in that respect is not bad because it, it, it provides better good and goods and services for people. This graph down here shows the Gini coefficient and this graph down here shows the trade frequency as we progress. So we're just gonna allow this, this simulation to run over a couple of years. So you can see the, the balances are going up and down. The Gini coefficient is rising to about 12%, so 0.12, which is probably the level of where Norway is. It's one of the most equal countries in the world. And the trade is happening at 350. And what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce an innovation called interest. So what we're gonna do is we're going to introduce those that have the highest balances are going to loan money at interest to those that have the lower balances, okay? Because they don't have money, because they're, they're not trading as much as the, as, the, as the wealthier guys, so they're gonna borrow money at interest. And let's see what it does to the various elements. So as you can see, you can now see there's, there's four individuals that are now bypassing by far the rest of the, of the balances. So the, the rich are definitely getting richer and the poorer are poorer. Have a look at what's happening to the Gini coefficient as a result of that. And look at what happens to trade frequency. So as people are borrowing money they, to, buy, to buy their consumables, they are able to afford less and are trading less. So the economy goes down, inequality goes up, and four or five, a handful of individuals get very wealthy. Now, just to share with you, this, um, this, is, a, this, this is a study that was done in, in Germany. Um, we obviously, if we put our money in the bank, we get interest income, and we pay interest if we have a bond, et cetera, or credit cards. But what we're not aware of is then every single product that we buy, there's an element of interest. So, for example, if a supermarket has to um, buy equipment, refrigeration equipment, and they lease it, they, they, they buy it, they borrow money to buy their refrigeration equipment, obviously there's an interest component in that. And they will recoup that interest component from, from us at the checkout counter. So often we're actually paying more interest than we're earning. And they did a study in Germany where they took, they split up the population into, into um, deciles. And they said, um, so, so these are, the, these are the, the people that are paying more interest. So the red is interest paid, whereas the blue is interest received. So the, the, the bottom 80% in Germany are paying more interest than they're earning, okay? The 10% the are coming out even, and then the wealthiest 10% are earning more interest than everyone. So effectively, if you net those out, what you see is that there's, there's almost a, a hoovering effect of interest from the, the poor and the middle class into the pockets of the wealthy. And we're all doing it unwittingly. If we have, I've got a bank balances earning interest, but this is ultimately what is actually happening in terms of, our, in, in terms of the economy. And obviously this is what's driving the, the inequality. So let me jump, jump back to... So just to share another concept in terms of like what are the flaws of our, our design systems. So this is a, stu this is a study um, of complex flow networks. Um, so complex flow networks are anything, living organisms, river systems, ecosystems, urban systems, um, social systems, financial systems. And what in all these systems, there's a pattern that's been picked up that is common to all. And that is that there is always a balance between, on the one hand, efficiency, and on the other hand, diversity and connectedness. So, um, and then on this, on this axis is the sustainability of the system. So what you find is that obviously that's the optimum. So it's the Goldilocks. A little bit of, a little bit of um, efficiency and a little bit of resilience gives you the optimum. But what you, so, so this is, why this is more efficient is that, you know, there's one point of communication. So this is like the army, for example. And this is, more like a, a flat structure where there's no clear leader and everyone's talking to everybody else. And obviously, both of them can have downsides. So the downside of this system is it's very brittle. So if something happens to that middle guy or that middle part of the system, the whole system collapses. If that is a bank and that happens, if that's a central bank and everyone's relying on that one bank in, in to remain solvent, everything collapses. This, on the other hand, the downsides of this is stagnation. 
where it's just everyone's connected to everyone else and you, you're expending a lot of energy in order to communicate and get things done. So this is, so this is um, what complex flow network, so as I said, this doesn't, it's not just about the money system, it's all systems that have been observed. And the way that we've set up our, um, our food systems, for example, where there's a monocrop, so this is a single crop, in order to get the efficiencies up, in order to be able to make as much food as possible, makes this crop very vulnerable. Because a single fungus could destroy the whole crop. So that, that explains the brittleness of, 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 of our system. On the other hand, we have incredible resilience and diversity. So this is a, uh, this is a jungle and this is a coral reef. And as you can see is that if one species dies, it will be replaced by another species. So there isn't this single piece that will, will destroy the, the, the entire system. So what we currently have with our, our financial systems, if you look at our currencies, most cur foreign currency exchanges are, um, are in 12 currencies around the world. So there's 12 currencies. Um, banks, very centralized. That we've, we've gone from too big to fail. Uh, there were, I think there were like um, 15 or 16 big banks too big to fail. It's now con it's concentrated to a handful, m maybe five or six. So we've gone even more down this curve in terms of our global financial system. And what we really need to do, and this is what complementary currencies, and I'm now going to come to the community currencies, do, does, is it introduces diversity and pushes us back up the curve to make us more um, resilient. And this is a quote from uh, uh, a guy called Chris Martinson. He wrote a book called The Crash Course. <coughs> And he said, if a single currency is like a concrete channel designed to carry the maximum amount of water, multiple complementary currencies are like wetlands designed to maximize the buffering of the water levels in times of drought and flood. So this is, so this is, the, this is the background in terms of these are the two key flaws that we see. So just to share a little bit about complementary currencies and community currencies or local currencies, these are all very similar names um, for the same thing. They're not, they're, not, they're not new. They're happening all over the world. In fact, in Latin America, there's probably about, I think in Brazil alone, there's over 200. 200. There are um, complementary currencies happening in, in Japan. Um, there's one in particular which is fascinating called the Ferreira Kipu which um, specifically addresses the care of the elderly. So one of the things that happened in the late 80s is the Japanese economy just stalled and has never recovered. So literally for the last three, four decades, the Japanese economy has been on, on a decline. And to compound things, the, they have an aging population. So there's the, the ratio of elderly people to young people is very, very high. So you've got a, young, a small young population trying to look after care for an older population. And they've come up with a system, um, and this is one of the um, ex-ministers, the justice minister actually, that they've come up with a system whereby if my mom lives in Johannesburg, I can, I become part of a system called Ferreira Kipu, I can care for an elderly person where I live in Cape Town. And I can t help them with shopping, I can watch TV with them, I can cook dinner for them, I can take them to a movie. When I do that, I earn credits which my mom can use in Johannesburg with a young person in Johannesburg to do similar things. So what you find is you find instead of elderly people getting carted off to, to, to a old age homes and literally sitting there on their own, you've got communities, li linkages between young people and old people um, creating these incredible bonds and it's, it's not costing the government a cent. And it's, it's really, you know, care, care, is care is gonna be coming, coming into um, focus in a big way. Um, in more sort of generically, um, but in particular, that's obviously care for the elderly. Um, and in the UK, there's 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 uh, currency. So in Brixton, so Brixton is a borough of London. Uh, there's about sixty thousand people that live there. They have something called the Brixton Pound. So the way it works is that you can exchange Brixton uh, British pounds for Brixton pounds, and then you can only spend the, the Brixton Pound locally. So. Each of these systems are designed in a different way. So there isn't a single design. But the, what's different about them is they provide an alternative to our current monetary system. So it's, uh, we're not, and, th and that's why the word is complementary. They're not meant to replace the RAND. We're not meant to, we're not trying to replace the national currency, but what we're trying to do is design alternative money systems 
that are better at, uh, um, at serving the function than our current monetary system is. And that's just a, a, a shot. So this is, this is a couple of uh, just some headlines, some recent headlines from The Guardian, from Forbes, and from CNN, really talking about local currencies and the rise in the US and why it matters. Um, could community currencies produce a more sustainable financial system? Um, this is the, the launch of the, I think there's an Exeter pound that has just launched. Okay, so just to, just to come back to how um, complementary currencies address inequality, we're going to go back to the same simulation. And what we're going to do now, so you've seen the effects of interest on, the, on this little village economy. We're now going to introduce a complementary currency. So this complementary currency is a parallel currency that can be used for people to satisfy their, their basic goods and services. So we introduced this, you it's very difficult to see, but there's a little green bar right next to these currencies. So you can see it's not meant to replace the national currency. It's really meant to be, to be providing an alternative. Can you see what's actually happening is the balances of the wealthy are now going down because they are lending out less money be because people are using these complementary currencies to, to um, meet their the basic goods, uh, good needs and services. You can see what's actually happening with the Gini coefficient. It's now coming back down to the levels that it was. And have a look at how, how rapidly the jump of trade was with this intro, uh, introduction of community currencies. So that was because the, 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 there's an almost immediate increase in liquidity. So what actually happens when people are borrowing money is that people hoard their money and they don't want to spend it. So it's sitting in the bank somewhere. It's not in the economy actually um, flowing around. Okay, so the next, so the next uh, thing that complementary currencies do is they help money circulate locally. And let's, let's, let's have a look at why that's important. So if this is a, a local community, a small community, and this money is, let's say, it's a, it's a social grant that's coming in, or it's a, it's a remittance that I'm sending to my mother that lives in another town. So typically what happens is that um, she receives it, and almost immediately she'll probably go to the spa or one of the big chain stores, spend the money, and the money's out of the, out of the community. So it doesn't actually spend much time circulating in the community. So what that introduces is, and, and I think in the interesting thing that we're observing between Kenya and South Africa is that because our multinational, our big companies have done so well in terms of their supply chains, it's almost decimated the informal business trade between small businesses. So there's, it's it, that concrete channel that uh, was referred to in the previous quote, we have fantastic concrete channels. But what that means is that the, mo the, the money doesn't spend any time in, 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 small com in local communities. So this is, this is the effect of, of, of a local currency, is that it would be spent in the currency, but then it would, could only be spent inside the, 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 the community. So just to give an example, if this is 20 the equivalent of 20 rand. If I go to a restaurant and I give a tip with, with a local currency of 20 rand, the waiter then takes that 20, the equivalent 20 rand of complementary currency and pays for a taxi ride home. The taxi, rider t the taxi driver takes that currency and buys a meal. In that one evening, we've created 60 rand of value. So what's more important um, in terms of the liquidity of communities is how much this currency is circulating in the community. If it's being hoarded and it's stuck, then there's no liquidity in the community and there's no trade. And often what happens is you have a lot of excess capacity in these communities. So um, in many ways, the, the currency conversation and, um, and, and the, the work that we're doing in Flow really is starting the conversation about how can we localize not only the monetary flows in our community, 
but how can we localize our, our production of, our, of goods and services that so we don't have to ship them in from thousands and thousands of kilometers away? How do we localize our distribution? Um, and, and how do we make these communities more resilient? How do, we, how do we buffer these communities? An interesting point to share, one of the oldest complementary currencies is, is a currency called the VIR, W-I-R, um, which has been in Switzerland. It was introduced in Switzerland in the, in the, in the 1930s. So it was between the wars, and obviously there was, there was, there was a massive economic downturn in Switzerland as there was over the, um, in, in the whole of Europe. And there were, the banks weren't lending money. So it's very similar to what's happening today, is that there's panic in the markets, the banks aren't lending money to anybody, and there's, it's literally everyone's just frozen. And 12 entrepreneurs got together and they said, well, we've got, we've got money in our bank accounts, so why don't we set up a lending club where we can lend money to each other? We don't have to ask the bank for the loan. We know each other, we trust each other, so we, and, and there actually is, uh, I believe in Swiss German, it stands for we. Um, so it's, it's together. Collectively, we will be able to support each other to, to, um, to run our businesses. This currency has been running since, uh, since 1930s. There's a bank now, a Veer Bank. In fact, 25% um, of, um, of small, medium enterprises use the currency on a regular basis. And what studies, studies on the currency, because it's one of the longest complementary currency, so it sits next to the Swiss franc. Um, they've done studies on it and they've shown that it has a counter-cyclical effect. So when the Swiss franc is under pressure, so when the economy is really struggling and there's a lack of liquidity in the market and nobody's spending and, and the Swiss franc is, is under pressure and going down, what happens is more and more people use the VIR. And then when the economy recovers, it balances out again. More and more people use the Swiss franc. So there's this, there's this wonderful balancing effect that, that actually happens. So um, we believe that through the introduction of a complementary currency, and this is the symbol for the complementary currency that we've introduced um, in the Bakrafi area. I'm just going to focus on the one area um, for, the, for the last uh, part of this talk. Um, and we, uh, we, we really believe, so we really believe in order to deal with the, these global crises that are happening, and we're not, we're not alone in this. We have to start from the grassroots. So we need to be working at the town level. We need to be working at the region level. We need to be working at the city level. If we're trying to do it at the large scales, I think, I think we're actually going to fail because the complexity of trying to, um, try to get this done um, doesn't make sense. And ultimately what this is, is actually doing is it's rebuilding social capital. So in the same way that the old money system was breaking down social capital, this thing will only work if trust starts being um, generated between people in the community. And it's very difficult to develop trust with someone that's a thousand miles away, a thousand kilometers away. But you guys all trust each other, you know each other, you are in a community. Um, so it's possible to, 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 to build something like this. So our focus is in, in we, so we're working in three specific areas. Um, so we, and, and, and within these spheres, we're focusing on, on, on three elements. So civil society, we're working with young people. So young people are, I mean, the unemployment rate of young people is, is over 50% in this country. So unemployed uh, and underemployed. Um, so we believe that by working with young people, the young people are going to be the future, and if one can support them to have an alternative, this will, um, this, this, um, this will make a difference. We're working with local government, so we believe that we need to support local government, whether it's a municipality in a region, whether it's a, um, a local city council. Local government is a key partner in enabling this. And finally, we believe that informal, not to the exclusion of formal businesses, but informal businesses are the ones that really, really need these currencies to actually start picking up. So we're working with uh, these uh, three spheres of, of business. And, and the the... The currency, as I mentioned, is really one part of the project. It's really an enabling component. It's not only about money and the currency. I chose to focus on the currency in this presentation just because of the, the amount of time that we had and the complexity of the project. But what we believe is that informal businesses will be able to trade amongst themselves using the currency when the trust starts returning and the, the old patterns of, I'll just go and buy it from the supermarket 
start disappearing. Um, young people will start, be, uh, will, will start small businesses that will be able to earn in this currency, and I'll share an example of that. And then the local government will start be able to, we, we're working with the local government to see if they could start accepting rates in the local currency, which can then get spent back into the community. So that would be a, a, a way to alleviate um, a lot of the challenges. So this is something that will be shared by all. It doesn't belong to any, any particular party. We, and the, the, the way that we've started going in is through the informal businesses. So, so the brunt, not the brand, the brunt, which stands for the Berg Refir Rand. So Berg Refir, if you recall, is the one area that, we, uh, that we're working in. Um, what's great is that the, the community currency is not meant to be hoarded. So there's no interest on the money. It's meant to be spent. It's meant to circulate around the community as quickly as possible. So it's a community local currency. It's equivalent in value to the Rand, but does not replace it. So it does, people can't be confused around, okay, well, I'm, I'm selling this for 20 rand, but you know, what is it in Brandt? Is there an exchange rate? It's exactly one-to-one. -one. So there's no confusion there. It can only be used in the biography area. If I bring a Brandt to Cape Town, nobody's going to accept it. And that's appropriate because we want the money to stay circulating in the local economy. It's backed by local goods and services. So this is a particular design that we're actually using. Um, People sometimes back, so in Brixton, if I'm buying 100,000 Brixton pounds with 100,000 pounds, I'm essentially backing the Brixton pound with the British pound. So that's what I'm backing the money with. What we're backing, what the, this design, and this is a design that, um, that Will Ruddick has pioneered in, in Kenya, is that it's um, each, it's the currency is launched by a network of small businesses, and each business backs. The, so each business gets a small portion of currency, which is 500 brunt in the case of the, of the Bakhafir area, and it, it's backed by their goods and services. So what that means, if I'm a baker and I make bread for 10 brunt, then effectively what I've committed to the network is I'm backing, I'm receiving this 500 brunt and I'm backing it with 50 loaves of bread. So I'm, I will promise that if somebody comes to my, to my store to buy bread, I will exchange the bread for the brunt. So that's the commitment that you get from the local businesses. Um, it's, it's shown to increase the sales of businesses that accept brunt. Um, the, the example in, in the VIR, what they found is that people will first shop or they'll, they'll first buy from a lawyer or a restaurant or whatever that accepts VIR than from someone that only accepts Swiss francs. So it's a way of marketing um, these small businesses. Um, and finally, it, it helps the local economy when times are tough. It has that counter-cyclical effect that I, I, I mentioned earlier. So this is just a, an aerial shot. How did we, how did we put the currency in place? Um, this is, so this is an aerial shot of, this is Picketburg. So this is the AN7 that um, rushes past Picketburg. And then there's this small, so in, in the Bergrafi area, there's a small little valley um, where there's a community called the uh, Goedverwacht. And it's an amazing, it's, it's really, it's a food basket of the region. And um, what, so one of the first things we did, we worked with uh, eight young people out of jobs um, uh, and out of school that are technically very literate. And they, the first thing they did is they mapped the businesses, both informal and formal in their communities. And not only the, the informal businesses, but we asked them to map the non-obvious businesses. So the obvious businesses are the one where I walk down the street, I see a sign, that's a carpenter, or that's a, you know, that's a shoe repair shop, or whatever. The non-obvious businesses, the way that they identified them was by asking the question, if I was going to get married, who would make the cake? Who would make the dress? Who would the DJ be? Where would we hire the tent from? So these businesses are thriving in these communities, but it's, there's no real yellow pages that can actually reveal what, um, what this is to each other, so what these business, where these businesses are. So we map the businesses, the little red dots, so our GPS coordinates of both Kutfevacht and, uh, and Picketburg. Our storyteller extraordinaire takes the young people on a training course. It's a five-day training course where they learn to, with second-hand iPhone 4s to make movies. So that's everything from selecting an interesting character. So these are short movies, like the little two-minute documentaries. Selecting an interesting character writing the script, going and doing the interview, 
filming the interview with the phone, coming back to the office, uploading the shots to, to a secondhand iMac, editing it, adding music, adding um, front and back, and then uploading to YouTube. Within five days, these young people learned how to do this. And in this way, they could tell the stories of their community. So one of the first things we started doing is making movies about local business. So these are people that were invisible in the communities, and in the community, um, the community meetings we had, we would show these movies to each other. So we would reflect the community, the business, the, what's, 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 what's working in the community back, um, back to the people. Um, this, is, this is just a, an, another thing we did with, uh, so as I mentioned, UCT is a partner. So UCT is actually doing research on the work that we're doing to see um, what, the, um, what the, um, the effects of introducing a, a community currency are. And the, the research is all done on these phones. So these phones are not just phones. They are GPS devices. They are cameras. They are communication devices. They are research devices. They are multiple devices, and these youngsters are learning how to, how to become enumerators. And then what we do is we pull this all together into a, a yellow, a yellow pages, or the brand, what we call the brand kits. We have many, many, many community meetings where we share information and, um, and, and educate the, the community about what happens. So these are the, um, these are the, the, uh, the, the nominations of the brand. So Dan, Daniel Goodman, who's our um, designer extraordinaire and also a communication strategist, designed these notes and they were printed in Cape Town. They've got multiple security features. They've got a, um, a foil um, that's, uh, that's very difficult to replicate. They're embossed. So each of these images obviously represents something. And all, all of these images were selected by the community. So this one obviously talks to solar power. So the, the wording on it is van krach tot krach. Um, this one is, is about food that's grown in the new region, it's, and, the, and the, little, the little saying here is kos um, tukoms. This is around uh, conserving water, and the message is water is lever. And this little heart here, which is the same little heart that you see here, is really all about community. So if you start rebuilding the social capital in these communities, what you're doing is you're building these trust networks, and it will make these communities more resilient in the face of these impending crises. Um, that's a shot from, uh, from the march um, that we did, and these are some stickers, and there was all sorts of material that, that, that we developed for the, for the launch. Um, um, these are some, some, uh, some, this is from Kokstad, so as you can see, the, the currency in Kokstad we call the K-Mali. Um, I-Mali in Kosa is, is money, so the, it's the Kokstad I-Mali, K-Mali. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we launched, we launched on, on the 18th of July, which was um, Nelson Mandela's birthday. Um, and these, were the, these are the notes. Very similar looking, which is quite interesting, is that they wanted similar looking notes. So the, the images, um, so the mountain is different. So this is Mount, uh, Mount Curry in Kokstad, whereas the other mountain was Picketburg. I mean, it's very, um, the, the logo is obviously different. They've got different uh, Bato Pele, so they choose a different they chose a different language for each of the notes. Amandla Akuti. So power from the sun, basically. And uh, what is life? And here's some images from the from the launch in Coxstadt. And again, very different, uh, very different communities, very, very different expressions, different currencies. They can only be spent in their respective communities. And uh, it's early days. I, you know, my what what I say is that um, that we, we, we've, we're basically at the end of the beginning. And uh, we've, we've got, I think we've got a long way to go, particularly because we need to rebuild and support the development of these bonds um, that have been pretty much uh, decimated by our industrialized supply chains.